Hi, welcome to On the Block. I'm Ed Wilkinson, and today we're in Douglaston. We're going to be talking with Father Mark Matthias, who's assigned to Our Lady of the Blessed Sacrament Parish over in Bayside. Father Mark, welcome to the show. Thanks, Ed. It's great to be here. Now listen, you know, all the lights and the cameras, this is all hat to you, right? I mean, you, you know a little bit about the media. Yeah, I do. I do. I actually uh, have a degree in radio TV film that I got from, well, what is now known as Rowan University uh -huh. in, uh, in South Jersey. So my big dream, of course, was to be a news anchor. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, on one of the networks uh, delivering the news. But after working uh, in radio and local cable TV, you know, doing the news, I didn't like it. Well, well, what didn't you like about the, the news? There's always something exciting happening. Yeah, but it was the same tragedy after another. And uh, it was actually depressing. And I almost felt like a vulture, you know? It's like I'm always like having this, you know, unfortunate negative news, you know, that I'm delivering. And I think it sort of, you know, started to get me a little depressed. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I thought, well, this is a curious state that I'm in. I've worked very hard to find a job, to get it, you know, the experience that you need to move up. And I, I said, why am I doing this if I don't really, really enjoy it? <laughs> so then you moved to TV, though. You got a job in TV, right? Well, I, I kind of got out of it uh, for a little bit, not sure what I was going to do. And uh, that's when I started working for a local company in Philadelphia as a copywriter, because uh, I had good writing skills, obviously, you know, uh, being a reporter and working as a news director at the local uh, radio station. And so while I was there, I discovered this new invention called an Apple 2CI. A little, you know, personal computer, and you know, we started doing a lot of work on it and graphic work and stuff like that. And so suddenly, I had a skill, and uh, then I had a, another avenue or path to pursue another dream that I had, which was to go into acting. Mm -hmm. so, but what? Well, wait a minute. Tell me about being a weatherman on TV. You were a weatherman on TV for a yeah, while, right? Yeah, for a local cable station, <laughs> a real rinky-dink operation, and so um, you know, it was all local origination back then. I know you understand what that is. And that was one of the uh, requests that the community uh, had to provide for uh, you know, the people, wherever you got the license to have a cable company, so you had to provide local events. Uh -huh. And so that's where you got you know, your experience. And so yeah, I was a local weather guy and uh, entertainment director as oh. well. Did so sort of what you're doing. How about a little meteorology? Did you have a little background in it? I you actually just took one read? course in meteorology <laughs> and also did a lot of reading up on it and uh -huh. uh, uh, kind of like faked my way through it. Uh, but it was more of a personality than an authority. Uh -huh. Now, at any point during this time, were you thinking about becoming a priest? Going to Catholic school and elementary school, I think every Catholic kid thinks about the priesthood. Um, most do until they discover girls. <laughs> so at that right? point, yeah. Uh -huh. um, you know, the hormones take over, and uh, even though I thought about it, uh, you know, I thought, well, one day I would, you know, uh, meet the right girl, get married, and, you know, have a family. Mm -hmm. So uh, at different times as life went on, you know, I would think, you know, maybe as one relationship wouldn't work out, I would think maybe I wasn't meant to be married, you know, maybe I was meant to be a priest. And then the last time I thought that is when I actually pursued it and said, well, I've thought about this on and off, why don't I actually take a step towards it and see if this is where the Lord wants me and if I could be happy being a priest. And so I actually spoke to Bishop DiMarzio about this and said, I'm not sure the Lord is calling me to be a priest. Is there any way that I can kind of, you know, put my toe in the water and yeah. just, you know, see if it's, you know, where I'm supposed to be? And he said, sure, you know, um, at any time you can discern out. And that's how I did it. You but know. before that, you took a little trip out to Hollywood and you, you had a little uh, career out there too, right? I did, I did, because once I realized I had a marketable skill by knowing, you know, computer graphics, I then uh, went to New York and started working up there and realized I could pay the bills and also take classes in acting, and then, you know, start pursuing another dream that I had. Mm -hmm. And eventually that led me off to California. So tell us about Hollywood. I mean, did you get some work out there on uh, television? I or did. What were you doing? Yeah. I did. They said I had a good commercial face. Uh -huh. And sure enough, uh, the people that I did know in the industry out here said, you should really be out there. There's a lot more work in uh, television and film for, you know, a guy with your look. Uh, and so uh, when I went out there, immediately I was able to get an agent and he started sending me out. And so lo and behold, I started being a professional actor, actually <laughs> earning a little bit of money. Uh -huh. uh, Did you do ads? I mean, that's where the money is in the ads, right? At the time it was um, until cable TV came. And then there were so many ads that are uh, you know, being produced that they actually continue to lower the rates, the union rates. Um, for every ad that you did, the royalties began to shrink and shrink and shrink. They said there's more work, yeah. 
you know, but now the royalties are going to be smaller because suddenly you had 300 channels on cable mm -hmm. of people advertising, so it didn't pay as well. You know? how, how about films? Now, you, you were in a couple of movies of the week on television? Yeah, or? probably the one that people would recognize me the most is uh, the Michael Jordan story, oh. where I played uh, Chicago Bulls, Abel Broxton, and Abel had a cocaine problem. Now, this is acting, this is in the movies, right? And so this was during the 80s when the Bulls were not very good, but Michael Jordan um, joined the team. And of course, I was part of the reason why the Bulls weren't doing so good. I was a party animal and I didn't take playing basketball seriously. And so um, it's uh, called uh, Michael Jordan, uh, an American story or an American dream or something like that. And uh, once in a while, they'll put it on TV. <laughs> and so once in a while, people will recognize me from it. Well, you're a big guy. How tall are you? Uh, I'm about 6'3 and a quarter. OK, so that's, that's why you were cast as a basketball player? Or? Yeah, as a tall guy, usually that's what happens. You yeah, know, you, yeah. But you're lucky if you do get typecast, because uh, I also did another show called Hang Time, which was on uh, NBC Saturday mornings. And I had a recurring role for three years as the referee. <laughs> so again, another tall guy playing basketball, and even part of the interview when I went into the casting director at NBC Studios, um, at the end of the uh, audition, she tossed me a basketball and she said, okay, show me what you can do. Because yeah. they wanted to make sure that you knew the sport. Yeah, well, did you, I mean, were you a basketball player? Oh, sure, yeah, sure, yeah. sure. Okay. Uh -huh. And uh, I actually, you know, going into the audition, when I got the call back, I was like, oh, this is getting serious. I could actually have a recurring role. And so I actually bought a book on the rules. <laughs> you know, I studied it every minute I could, because that's what you had to do. You had to know the calls and stuff, because you had to make it look authentic. Um, so yeah, I had some really uh, fond memories of Hollywood. But eventually, um, I, uh, I decided to, uh, to move on, to come back to the East Coast. Yeah, but all, during all this time, were you close to the church the, you know, out in Hollywood? A lot of distractions, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. and I, I did get distracted, Ed. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I got so consumed with pursuing my dreams. And I literally worked two jobs all the time. You know, I had my you know, a regular job where I paid the bills at night, you know, uh, doing computer work, and then during the day I would audition. And so, you know, you can make up a lot of excuses as to why, you know, I don't, you know, have the time to go to Mass, or I don't feel like going to Mass, or the Lord knows that I love Him. Mm -hmm. You know, all the excuses we come up um, with uh, that slowly separate us from receiving our Lord mm -hmm. and, you know, living uh, our life according to his authority rather than our own mm -hmm. and that's what I started doing yeah. you know Jesus became uh, my buddy and my pal and he understood mm -hmm. so you know if I was living you know uh, in habitual sin or I didn't follow the commands of the church he understood because my friends understood and he still loved me and it was okay but there are consequences when you know we look at Jesus as you know being on our level rather than elevating ourselves to his level. Mm -hmm. And I remember in seminary, I learned a couple of terms called low Christology and high Christology. And I had brought Jesus down to low Christology. I looked at Jesus more of his uh, human qualities versus his divine qualities. Mm -hmm. So that's low Christology. And when I finally reversed that and made him the Lord of my life, that's when you know, my life began to change for the better. Right, we're going to take a quick break, and then we're going to get back to some of these distractions, but we'll get right back. Stay with us. You're watching On the Block. I'm Ed Wilkinson. This is Father Mark Matthias. We'll be right back. Welcome back to On the Block. I'm Ed Wilkinson, and this is Father Mark Matthias. Father Mark, we were talking a little bit about uh, Hollywood and some of the, the distractions out there. And, uh, and you mentioned you would thought about uh, getting married and family and life. So you must have had a couple of girlfriends along the way. Uh, was oh, that sure. a distraction? Well, yeah, that was one of them, especially in Hollywood. Um, you know, I think there's no greater concentration of beautiful women than in Hollywood. Um, but also, though, everyone's so focused on their careers, I didn't see myself settling down there. Uh, and. Uh, you know, I uh, eventually, you know, when I realized I wouldn't be able to support my own family, I um, wanted to move back east, be closer to my family, and have a regular job, and, uh, you know, begin another phase and another dream of my life, which was to settle down and have a family. So you came back and you settled in Queens, right? Yeah, yeah, I lived in Astoria. And, and what were you doing for work? I, uh, I worked in the city. I worked for J.P. Morgan Chase, and I worked in the creative services department. And so eventually I worked my way up to being a, a shift supervisor there. Mm -hmm and uh, managing a bunch of people and, uh, you know, having, a, again, a, a quasi-normal life. Mm -hmm. And that's when I had uh, already begun, you know, uh, taking my faith more seriously uh, before I left California. 9-11 um, had a very powerful impact on me. What happened? Well, um, I was in California when it happened, and I remember, you know, when I woke up in the morning, and I honestly thought that they were advertising a new movie, you know, a disaster movie. And um, I'm looking at the TV as I'm getting ready, 
And I thought, you know, that's really in poor taste to show that. Like, that, that's just like stepping the line. And I, again, like, I didn't really comprehend what I was watching until I realized, I said, this is, this is live. I mean, this, this is happening right now. And uh, what happened after that was where I was working, you know, everybody was talking about, you know, how could you do this? You know, you know what kind of people would do this type of thing? And um, so we had people who were of the Muslim faith where I worked, and I would ask them questions, you know, and they would explain a little bit about their faith, and then they would ask me about my faith and say, well, don't you, you know, Christians believe this? And I was embarrassed that I wasn't able to answer their questions um, and that uh, they actually probably knew more about my faith than I did about theirs. And so at that point, I decided to take my faith more seriously. So how did that manifest itself when you moved back to Queens? Well, that was, um, you know, part of the journey of, of, you know, just growing in a deeper relationship with our Lord. Um, to know Him is to love Him. And so, you know, the Bible tells us repeatedly that we are to grow in our knowledge of the Lord. And the more that I studied and the more that I understood my faith, rather than just going through the motions of my faith, uh, the more I was led into a closer relationship. You know, and that's what it is. It's like any relationship. The more you get to know someone, you know, um, the more you're going to bond with that person, the more you're going to understand that person, the more you're going to feel close to that person. And so uh, I realized that, I don't know, maybe it was part of God's plan that by, um, you know, drifting away from the church for a while, when I came back, I came back doubly strong. I was like the prodigal son, not like I was a prodigal son and uh, appreciated being in the, you know, the presence and the company of the father more so than when I left. So you, so you started getting involved in the parish over there in Astoria, right? Yeah, yeah, I started volunteering for the church. I had volunteered out in California too. Mm -hmm. uh, I liked working with Catholic big brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, again, I still did work for the Lord, but it was not as devout as I should have been, mm -hmm. you know. And as I decided to, I need to really practice my faith, you know, not just claim to be Catholic, but actually practice it according to the church's teachings. Uh, I realized that meant doing more ministry and helping out more. And so um, that's what I started to do, just volunteer more. I started teaching uh, catechism classes and volunteer for different projects that were going on. And that is part of, when I say part of, my journey back to, uh, or I should say not back to, but into the seminary. That the more time I spent doing ministry, the more I enjoyed it. Was there a specific moment when the light went off in your head and said, uh... All right, maybe I should be a little bit more serious about this as a vocation. You know, it actually started happening on Monday mornings. We would have our, you know, Monday morning meeting. And I would be in that meeting thinking about what I wanted to teach my kids next week about whatever we were talking about. And so I realized that's really where my heart was. And I just was going through the motions. It's like totally opposite happened. Whereas I was just going through the motions of being a Catholic, going to Mass because you're supposed to do that or, you know, uh, you got to keep the commandments or you're going to go to hell. You know, the opposite happened where here I was now, you know, um, thinking of the church more so than my life in the corporate world. So how do you take that first step then? Do you, do you go talk to somebody? Do you see a vocation director? I mean, how do, how do you get your foot in the door? Yeah, you, um, you do just that. Um, you pick up the phone, you go on the web, you find, you know, who might be interested in you and start saying, is this possible? You know, uh, um, in my 40s now, uh, I was in, uh, I had just gotten out of a relationship and I didn't want to date and different things were happening in my life. And I said, you know, let me just take a time out and think about the rest of my life and where I'm going in my life. And that's when I seriously began to think, maybe I wasn't meant to be married. Maybe this was just another dream that I pursued, um, but the Lord had a different plan for my life. But I still wasn't sure. So when I talked to, um, uh, the vocations director for the Diocese of Brooklyn, you know, I told him just that. I said, I don't know, you know, if this is where the Lord is calling me. I like working for the church, but the church needs priests, and I enjoy helping people. I, I love scripture. I started going to Bible study on a regular basis. I had been doing that for years, and I love sharing my faith with people, and I felt I had a better command of it. And I thought if I really want to help the church, you know, maybe this is one area that I could do it, because there's a real need for priests. So, you know, the big uh, scary thing about seminary is you think once you cross the doors, you're never going to get out, right? <laughs> and of course, nothing could be further from the truth. It takes a long time to become a priest. Sure does. Um, so you can know in your heart uh, whether it's where you're going to be happy and where the Lord's going to be happy 
you know, have you Isn't be. Isn't that a difficult decision, though? I mean, you were pretty set in your ways. You had all this experience, and all of a sudden, you're talking about a radical change in your life and, and going back to studies. I mean, that's got to be a difficult time, right? It was and it wasn't, Ed, because something had happened in me where going through the routine of life and working very hard you know, in the corporate field, um, I, I thought what a luxury it would be to just like sit and read and learn the faith and study the Bible, because that's what I enjoy doing the most. Mm -hmm. I would come home from work, and it started by me watching videos on the faith, you know, Dr. Han, uh, Dr. Peach, uh, Petrie, and um, all these other great Catholic scholars. And uh, that was my entertainment. You know, I turned off the crap that was on TV and the cable, and I started learning more about the faith. And then that led me into more Bible study. And I just enjoyed it. And I could spend hours, you know, reading, whether it's the Catechism or, uh, again, uh, the Lamb's Supper by Dr. Hahn. And I was just like, wow, look at all this stuff that, you know, makes our faith so rich. And the more I read, the deeper I uh, became in my relationship with Christ and with the church. Mm -hmm. And so, actually, I thought, that wouldn't be so bad if I got to spend, like, my whole day <laughs> learning about our Lord um, and learning about the faith. So you were ready to come back into some kind of an academic setting like that. You know, when I look at back on my entire life, it is though there came a cross, you know, I came to a crossroads in my life where I was exactly where I was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Like, mentally and spiritually, I was ready to consider the priesthood. And even then, of course, I'm like, I, I don't know, you know. But the bishop, thank God, was open enough to let me to discern and said, if any time you feel this isn't right for you, just let us know. Sure. So one semester led to the next and to the next. All right, we're going to get back to those crossroads in a minute. But uh, right now, we're going to take a quick break. You're watching On the Block. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to On the Block. I'm Ed. This is Father Mark, and we've been talking about the, his road to the priesthood. You're at a crossroads there. So Bishop DiMarzio accepts you into the program, and he says, see what you think about this thing. And, but he sends you to a special seminary, right? Uh, he actually... Pope John Twenty-third. Yeah, up in uh, Western Massachusetts, and it was for later vocations. Right. And I'm in my 40s now, yeah. and I actually began here at Douglaston uh, with uh, my brother seminarians who were at least half my age. <laughs> and despite being a great group of guys, um, you know, there was an entire generation there, it seemed like there was uh, certain things I couldn't relate to them with, like, you know, the Reagan years. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, I expressed this to my uh, spiritual advisor and I said, you know, sometimes I, I don't know if the priesthood's right for me because it can seem lonely. I said, maybe it's just my age, you know, and being able to relate to guys that are younger than me and then be able to relate to me. And that's when he brought up, he said, well, you know, there are seminaries you can go to for later vocations. And I didn't know this. And so Bishop DiMarzio was kind enough to allow me to go visit those seminaries and then uh, see how I liked it. And when I visited, uh, uh, at the time it was Blessed John the 23rd up in uh, Massachusetts, um, I instantly was like, this, this felt right. Because yeah. uh, I met other men who were later vocations in their 40s and 50s, who had similar stories like my own. Mm -hmm. um, some were widowers, some um, you know, had been married and got an annulment. Um, some never got married like myself. And um, I, I just related to them. And so... Uh, so did you enjoy your seminary uh, years? Very much so. Yeah. Very much so. There's a lot of people have mixed emotions about the seminary, but uh, you enjoyed it. Yeah, I think that, um, again, because I was older and more, you know, uh, settled, uh, the idea of sitting there for hours on end reading and writing, you know, was very appealing to me. Mm -hmm. I had worked in the, you know, the corporate world, I worked in the entertainment world, I got to do what I wanted to do, and here I was doing what I wanted to do, but I was very focused on it. Mm -hmm. And my study habits were... I guess refined, mm -hmm. and so I found it very, very enjoyable. Mm -hmm. Any uh, any doubts as you worked your way through those four years of theology? Oh, absolutely, because you know there's uh, more to the priesthood other than learning theology. You know, it's the idea of living a celibate life, sure. um, the idea of obedience. You know, where for so long you lived on your own. I do did whatever what I you wanted, wanted to do. do. <laughs> I went where I wanted to go, and suddenly now I'm living in a you know in a, a small room, feeling like I was you know going back to my college days. And, but uh, again, I, I, didn't, I knew that it was only temporary. And this was part of my detachment from the world and my formation, you know. And I was never really a materialistic guy. Uh, but again, I was being prepared to take uh, the vows of simplicity. And that's what seminary formation helps you to do. 
to live a simple life. So when you got ordained though, you come back to Brooklyn to be ordained, right? Absolutely. And uh, what was that day like for you? Wow, um, I can honestly say it was the happiest day of my life. Okay. Yeah, and I had some pretty happy days pursuing <laughs> my dreams. Uh, and I think for the five and a half years that I was in seminary and then the culmination and seeing my family there um, and uh, just everything that surrounded the support that I had and uh, the mission that I was on, uh, that again, I loved talking about our Lord, I loved sharing the faith, I felt that I had the skills you know, to be a good preacher, to be a good minister, to help people, and everything had just come together. Mm -hmm. And here was the celebration of me being officially welcomed into the priesthood. And I was just, I was just in awe, I was stunned, I was happy, I was feeling so many different emotions. Yeah. And I also felt peace uh -huh. that this is because, again, I had five and a half years to think about it. And it wasn't until about my third year that I said, okay, I, th I think this is where I'm supposed to be. Maybe my fourth year, you know, <laughs> for sure. Um, and uh, then it was a, a great adventure. And into. what did your family think along the way? Did they fully support you? Or oh, did, did they say, are you crazy? <laughs> no, they said I was crazy the, the, when I went to New York and moved there. And then they said I was crazy when I went to LA. Um, but no, they, they said it, and this is so common. They said, what took you so long? Like if any one of us were going to be a priest, it would have been in you, wow. you know. And so they saw my vocation developing even when I didn't. Yeah. How does your journey help you now in your ministry as a priest? I think my life experiences uh, have helped me to relate to people um, in what their struggles are. Uh, whether it's paying the bills or being in a relationship, being frustrated, disillusioned with life. Uh, I had my disappointments. I had my setbacks. Uh, again, I had lofty dreams and, uh, and my fair share of failures as well. And uh, I went through periods of bleakness, of doubting God, of not feeling loved by God. Um, and also, again, uh, you know, reversing that process and going through different phases of spiritual growth uh, that I think have helped me to relate to people. And especially when I start to share my experiences with them, they know I know what they're talking about. Beautiful. And it's never too late, right? Amen. It's a perfect way to end. Thank you so much for being with us today, Phil Pleasure Moore. Being with you. And thank you for being with us. You've been watching On the Block. Ed Wilkinson, I've been talking with Father Mark Mathias. Hope to see you again next week.